but this is secondary, of course, to what the Bible says. And we got a condensed version of that today, a little workbook. And the only reason I'm using that is I really haven't taught Revelation from the early day. We're looking at uh, it having been written about 64 A.D., which changes the entire interpretation of the book. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day and the blessings of this life. We're thankful for your word that is a light to our path. We pray that we'll let that word be engrafted into our souls and our hearts, that it may save us, that it will guide us to heaven. Father, we're thankful for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin as long as we walk in the light of that word and have fellowship with you. Go with us through this study, and we pray that one day we'll have a home with you in heaven. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. There's only 11 verses. Let's just read the fourth chapter. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. which said, Come up thither, and I will show thee these things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts each had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay, we're getting into the highly symbolic language of the book. Taking the early date, well, first of all, we need to remember that uh, the book of Revelation, of course, is a symbolic book full of symbols and signs. And... Remember back in verse 1 of chapter 1, he said, John seeing this vision, and Jesus sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, these things which must shortly come to pass. And that's our uh, understanding that they're going to happen soon. Now, taking the late date, this the, the interpretation has usually been that this is talking about the Roman persecution of the church for the next two or three hundred years, or maybe thousands of years, I don't know, but uh, that really doesn't fit the context. So, uh, 
we're looking at the early date, which we've already looked at the, the introduction to that, the reason why uh, it makes sense that it is the early date, that through a transcription error, people attributed uh, the wrong emperor, that John was exiled to Patmos by Nero, not Tiberius. And that would put it in the mid to late 60s A.D., before the destruction of Jerusalem. So the brother here is contending, and, and I don't, we're going to go through it and read it, and this is for our consideration and study. And I've got the outline, if you don't have the book. We're looking at, now the word apocalypse means what in the New Testament? Hmm? What do we call the book? The word revelation. Revealing or revelation. We think of apocalypse as destruction, the end of the world, but actually in the Greek it means revelation or revealing of things that are hidden. So we're talking about a heavenly revealing, a heavenly exposition here. And he contends, and it fits the this if you've read the notes, that chapter 4 is the old a scene about the Old Testament because Jesus isn't mentioned. The Lamb isn't brought in until chapter 5. So let's look at the symbolism of chapter 4. He said, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and not into heaven, but in heaven. And so he heard a voice which sounded to him like a trumpet and was told him to come up, and he's going to show him things which must be hereafter. So he got a, he's got... Uh, all of this through chapter 11 of all this revelation. There, there's two or three different, this thing's going to be repeated a couple of times as we go through the book of Revelation. And so immediately I, I was in the spirit. And that reminds you of what Paul said. I knew a man once that was in the spirit. Well, he's in the spirit, I cannot tell, but he, he saw a vision of heaven. And to see heaven, why would he have to be, why would it have to be a vision? Paul said in Corinthians, what, flesh and blood cannot inherit heaven? We, we can't see it with our own eyes. It has to be a vision. And he said a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. So this is where we get the idea of a God sitting on a throne in heaven. And he looked and he saw one like a jasper and sardine are the same thing. It's a green stone, uh, kind of translucent. Can't really see through it, but it... You shine a light on it, it kind of translucent. And, uh, uh, no, no, I'm wrong. The, the sardine or sardine, I guess, is a red one. One's green, one's red. And there was a rainbow round about the throne inside, like an, under an emerald. Uh, God is not precious stones. This is just symbolism to describe the best that our human mind can, the glory of God the radiance of God's uh, goodness, greatness. And there was a rainbow, uh, whether that's a reflection of God's glory or that's just a reminder of God's uh, giving mankind a second chance with Noah, I'm not sure. He, can, he refers to Noah, but I don't. But God, remember that was his promise to mankind after the flood. He said a rainbow in the skies that he wouldn't destroy the world of the flood. And then he said, round about the throne are four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. Now white raiment it always represents... Anybody? Purity. Purity, righteousness. Not our own merited, but the righteousness we receive from Christ. So being, being in God's grace, we, uh, there's references to white raiment on earth and, and also in heaven. So they sat in their white raiment and then are had on their heads crowns. Now, there's two different interpretations of this. One is that these are the represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. But since he said that Jesus, the, the Lamb, isn't mentioned in this chapter, he believes that this represents the order of worship, that there were... 24 orders of worship of the priests under the Old Testament that would worship, that would lead the worship. And if we're going with the early date and we're looking at this as an Old Testament scene, uh, that probably, and if you got the book on page 176, there's a diagram 
uh, one man's idea of what this describes, that you have the uh, you have the throne, and this is going to be chapters four and five. Five introduces the lamb. We don't see the lamb yet, but then you see all these twenty-four elders sitting around, and he believes that 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 represents Old Testament worship. And out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices. And we're going we're gonna to see that, uh, I think it's later chapter, some of those voices are these beasts that are talking. Lightnings and thunderings uh, probably represents just the power of God. Uh, on Mount Sinai, what did we have? Thunderings and lightnings, earthquakes. The people, because of the tumult, the people were afraid to even get close to Mount Sinai. They were terrified of it. So this is all representative, I believe, of things from the Old Testament. Uh, and there were seven lamps of fire burnt, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, the word seven usually represents what? Completeness. Three is perfection. And Okay. So, uh, and we're going to have in chapter 5 the lamb with seven eyes, which also represents the spirits of God. This is probably the Holy Spirit, even though it's listed as seven spirits, plural, uh, the completeness of the Holy Spirit. And he said before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne were four beasts full of eyes behind and before. <coughs> and we're going to get more into these beasts talking later. Um... The four beasts with the six wings. Uh, let's see, I can't remember. Was it uh, Ezekiel? The seraphim had six wings. I don't know if these are the, represent the same spirits in heaven or not. But the first beast he describes like a lion, like a calf. Third beast had the face of a man. Fourth beast like a flying eagle. Um, and there's an artist rendering somewhere in the book, I think, of these. So they all had six wings, and the wings, my understanding of verse 8 is that the wings were full of eyes. And this just supposedly represents the power and omniscience of God is all seeing. God sees everything. We can't hide anything from him. Rest, they, they rest not day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty which was and is to come. That's where our song comes from, is that verse. And when they give glory and honor, then uh, the 24 elders worship him, fall down before him, throw their th crowns before him. And one of YC's favorite verses was 11 here, Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure... Were they created? So we have a scene here, and we're going to we're going to look at it from this point of view as we go through it. And all of this is up for your study and your you know our evaluation because we're going to go back to the Bible and see how this fits as we go through it. Remember, this was written in the first century to a first century audience in a code. Old Testament code symbolism that they would understand and the Roman Roman government wouldn't. So we're trying diligently to go back 2,000 years and understand what they were easily understood for them. So if this is an Old Testament scene then we've got uh, all of these things going on representing the Old Testament worship and the Old Testament lost the word. I assume everybody's read ahead in all of it, so throw it open for comments now. We just got the workbook, so I 
workbook looks like it's just a condensed version of the book. Um, the Thurlum scene. Well, he doesn't go into much detail in the, this workbook, does he? Let's go back here. Uh, the Living Beasts. First Living Beast. It was a lion, and he references back again. In Ezekiel, there's, Ezekiel has a vision of heaven, and he sees these, maybe the same spirits that are represented here. And one has a face of a uh, face of a lion, face of a man. Seems to be the same ones. They're described a little bit different in Revelation, but it, it seems to be maybe the same ones. I'm not sure why the symbolism is a little different, but it is. Seems to be anyway to me. Um, and he gives his reasoning for all of this back to. And he ties it back to Old Testament scripture. I'm not going to dig that deep into it unless you all want to. But if you've got the book and do your own study, he said, uh, remember, these people know the Old Testament. And all of this should strike a chord with them. It, it should say, hey, this, this looks like this. This is this. And we also had inspired people that the Holy Spirit, if need be, could explain it to them too back then. Anyway, that's the opening scene. He sees the throne scene in heaven. And if these are the, represents the courses of worship of the priest, then this is the Old Testament scene. We're going we're gonna to say that as we go through it, because... If it is the early date and the evidence he cited indicates it probably was the early date, then we're talking more about the destruction of Jerusalem than uh, the destruction of Rome. And so we're going to look at how God looked at Jerusalem and why God would destroy Jerusalem. We've kind of introduced the subject, but as we go through here, we'll see more about it. Anything, any other questions or comments through chapter 4? Again, the brother's book's not authoritative. It's just a commentary, but he cites a lot of references that we should study, and you know, we have we just have to keep studying. All right, chapter five is he believes the New Testament scene, and I tend to agree because we're we're introducing Jesus in here, the Christ, the Lamb. Actually, he wasn't the Lamb until he went to earth was he in the Greek it refers to him as the logos or the word before he came to earth but when John saw him coming down the road in John chapter 1 he said what behold the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world and of course that's a reference back to the Old Testament you remember when we were studying Hebrews that a lamb had to be sacrificed once a year by the high priest for the sins of the people Jesus became both the sacrifice and the priest, making the offering of himself. So he was the Lamb of God. All right, ch uh, chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the voice? and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders, 
stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat before the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us <clears throat> kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb which was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all, all that are in them heard I saying, Blessed and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Okay. <clears throat> the call went out. Who is worthy to open this book? Uh, nobody. No one. No one was good enough. Now, a book, we think of a book like this. It's bound with a spine and everything. In the first century, what was a book like? A scroll. Uh, either plant-based papyrus or vellum, which was animal skin. And notice he said it was written within and without. It's written on both sides. It's rolled up and it's sealed. And as we mentioned last week or week before, the custom was for a king, when he sent out a message, uh, he had a signet ring, so they would drip wax over the partition or where it met and he would seal it there are seven seals on this scroll seven seals that have to be broken before it can be opened and read and no one no one was worthy to open it except for the lamb um, verse 5 one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now this is understandable to anyone that's read the Old Testament and understands, uh, has heard the gospel in the New Testament. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. He was a descendant of David. He says he prevailed and to loose the seven seals thereof. How did he prevail? What did Jesus do? Uh, to never die again, yes. And he also, what? If the first, if chapter 4 is the Old Testament, he what? He kept the law perfectly. He fulfilled the covenant with Moses and the nation of Israel. And he was a sacrifice for sin. And he established his own kingdom. And he established his own covenant or testament. Uh, all of those things. So he, he prevailed doing what no man, no human being could do. No mere human being could do. So, he refers to Jesus, but then we see a vision. Now, this is why this is all highly symbolic. A lot of people take Revelation very literally. They take the 144,000 that we're going to get into as literal. They take the rain on earth as literal, which it doesn't say on earth. Uh, they, they take so many things very literally when this is obviously symbolic. So we have to be careful as we look at these symbols. So he describes Jesus, but then when he... When John turns in this vision, he sees a lamb. Um, and somehow, and there's a there's an artist rendering here on page 185. It's basically a human figure with a lamb's head, which makes sense because a lamb doesn't have hands. He couldn't take the book out of the out of the God's hand. And there, there's his representation of the beast. 
I don't, this is just his view of it. So he, verse 6, he turns and he sees in the middle of the throne next to the Father, which, what is, what does uh, Peter say in Acts 2? And then when the Hebrew writer says Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. So that's where he is. And a lamb, as it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And again, we're back to the, more than likely, the Holy Spirit. The sent forth unto all the earth. Okay. Uh, Jesus returned to heaven, and before he ascended to heaven, what did he promise the apostles? He ascended the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, in, in the upper room, John uh, 14, 15, 16. So... The Spirit's been sent out to guide them into all truth. So the Lamb, in in this figure, which is Christ, came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. We assume that's the Father, has to be. Uh, and when he had taken the book, they were all they all bowed down. And notice every one of them having harps and golden vials. People say, well. We know instrumental music is okay because they have harps in heaven. Instrumental music in the church today is okay because they have harps in heaven. Well, they have harps and golden vials full of incense, but the incense represents the prayers of the saints. So if the incense isn't really incense, why are the harps really harps? See, it's all symbolic. We can't, you can't tie that to a literal thing. So they sung a new song. We have a song in the book about a new song, too, that praising Christ because he was worthy. Um, let's see, verse 10. I wanted to talk about 10 for a little bit. Um, Talking about reigning on earth. Okay. Uh, we get to chapter, on over a few chapters over, it talks about reigning, Jesus reigning a thousand years. The idea of reigning doesn't mean that we are government authorities. We only reign how? You know, if a king reigns, then his children, his, the princes and princesses, have authority and reign too, in a sense. Uh, as being a child of God, we have that privilege that, in a sense, of reigning. There's no context where there's going to be an earthly reign. Now, a lot of people take symbolism of uh, revelation try and make it sound that way and they take uh, the prophecies of Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah out of context and say well you know the the Jewish dispensation is supposed to last forever so God's going to restore the nation of Israel and he's going to reign on it now that's uh, we, we're studying the Old Testament and it's very clear that God told them that they would be a nation as long as they were faithful and if they stopped being faithful, he'd take the nation away from them. And he he did. He took them into captivity to teach them a lesson in uh, Jeremiah, what we're studying on Wednesday night, and now he's doing away with it permanently. He's not going to restore it. He's grafted in. What did what did, uh, what did uh, John the Baptist, John the Immerser, say back in Matthew? He's talking to the Pharisees, and he said that the axe is laid at the root of Judaism, and God's going to cut you off. And Paul says later that, the Gentiles have been grafted in. The church is the new Israel. There's not going to be a restoration. So this ruling and reigning is a spiritual rule and reign. Whether we're on earth or whether we're in heaven, we're a child of God. And I believe that's the context. And then uh, he's talking about the angels and the heavenly host and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. In other words, it was innumerable. It was a vast, vast number. So, 
saying with a loud voice, verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb which was slain to receive power and riches. Wait a minute. Jesus received riches? He was a carpenter. He had nothing but the clothes on his back. The soldiers gambled for his clothes when he was crucified. What riches did he have? Again, we're back to the riches of heaven, spiritual riches. Uh, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. And then the last two verses are about bowing down, worshiping Christ. So if four is an Old Testament, a vision of the Old Testament worship with the 24 elders, then we have the Old Testament telling him that the only way to open the, they couldn't open it. Under the Old Testament, there was no way, and this this rule and reign and, re, and, and adoption to God's family and basically salvation is what we're talking about, couldn't happen because of Jewish Judaism the Old Testament. The 24 elders didn't have the power. No one had the power. Only Christ had the power to open up God's salvation. What did Paul say? Uh, Colossians and Ephesians, both he talked about breaking down the middle wall of partition, which was the Old Testament, so that God could reconcile both Jew and Gentile in one body, which is the church. And so that's what we're looking at here in verse 5, that breaking down of that wall, salvation offered to all mankind. I believe. Any questions, comments, rebuttals? Am I going too fast? As usual? Sorry. Slow me down. Well, I'll read ahead in the workbook for next week and see if I can slow it down a little bit. Anything jump out at anybody that you wanted to ask a question about or talk about? Or... These aren't the controversial chapters. We're going to get into the thousand-year reign and the 144,000 and all of that, and that's what everybody quibbles about a lot. It's, yeah, they're, it's a good question, did you read ahead? Well, I mean, I kind of have a thought, but I don't Well, know. share the thought, then. I mean, obviously, I guess. And of course, why was God destroying Jerusalem? We've kind of we talked we talked about that for a couple of weeks in the introduction. Uh, he destroyed it partially in Jeremiah's day because of their idolatry and their adultery and all of the things going on. And they had to be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years, and only a small remnant came back. I think I overheard Steve talking before class that most of them were dispersed all over the known world at the time, but just a very few wanted to come back under uh, uh, Cyrus, I believe. So we are discussing the Old Testament and the fact that it's been supplanted by the New Testament, and it's only through the blood of Christ that we can go to heaven. And the fact that the Jews after Jesus died on the cross, have no special claim to God. Paul said, not all of Israel are Israel. 
Israel is a spiritual Israel. Israel was the physical descendants of uh, Abraham. Or, excuse me. But now we're spiritual children of Israel, of Abraham. Galatians says we are all children of Abraham. That is Jew and Gentile that are in Christ. Galatians 3 and 4. If we're in Christ, then we're a descendant of Abraham spiritually, not physically. So, <coughs> And the Galatian writer makes it clear in Galatians 3 that, that the law was temporary. It was just a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring the Jews to the knowledge of Christ. And when Jesus came, the law was set aside. It wasn't needed anymore. Because the law wasn't needed, he said, you remember, excuse me, back in Hebrews, it said the... Uh, the priesthood was changed from the tribe of Levi to Judah where Jesus was because the priesthood was changed the law had to be changed because the law of Moses didn't allow Judah, anyone from Judah to be a priest so Jesus couldn't be our high priest under the law of Moses so the law had to change all of this is leading us up to the fact that the Jews have no special claim to Jerusalem anymore it was a special place but Jesus told the woman at the well in John 4 you know the time's coming it doesn't matter whether you worship in Jerusalem or in the mountains as long as you worship in spirit and truth under the Jewish dispensation they had to go to Jerusalem at least three times a year for worship for the fest, feast days and the worship but under the Christian dispensation under the New Testament where we worship isn't nearly as important as how we worship and that we do it sincerely from the heart so all of that's being taken out of the way, and we're building to that, I think, in, in all of this symbolism. And if that doesn't turn out to be true, I'll eat those words without any season. But that seems to be the direction we're headed. I, I was referring to the ones he's writing to. Hmm? I was referring to the ones he's writing to, the Christians. Seven churches. Yeah, seven churches. And, and remember, the word seven means what? complete so there's a possibility that even though it's addressed to these seven churches uh, it's meant for all Christians all over the known world at that time obviously it's not it's meant for the brethren in Jerusalem because uh, they need to know what's going to happen now they've been warned we have them Matthew 24 Jesus warns that Jerusalem's going to be destroyed so here here's the final warning basically it's almost here get ready Nero, yeah. Remember we said that Nero in the original language is Neron. And if you apply the Hebrew letters for numbers, then Neron comes out 666, which makes Nero the beast. All of this, you know, all of, this, all of it clears up if we put it to the early date, I believe. Because under the late date, all the, well, who's the beast? Who's the beast? It's been everybody from the Caesars to... Hitler to now Donald Trump. <laughs> I don't know who they're calling. But if it's the early date then it's and it's about to happen, like he said in chapter 1, verse 1, then it's somebody that's in power as he's writing. And the only one in power when he wrote this, if it is in 64, is Nero. And the Neron bears that out. It's 60. It, all the pieces, it's like a jigsaw puzzle of a picture that nobody's seen for 2,000 years. And we're having to figure out where the edges are and how to fill it in. It's, a lot, it's, a, it's completely different than any other book in the New Testament because of the symbolism. But it is very similar to Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Anything else on And, and if you think of anything, we'll come back. I mean, we're not going to rush through it. I, if you want to come back and do four and five again or any other questions come up, we want to understand it. We, won't, we don't want to just say, well, we've studied Revelation. We want to do our best to try and understand it. We do know that
the bulk of the book is imminent because it's shortly going to come to pass. But we need to learn what we can from it, anything that we can learn to help us be faithful Christians. Okay. Right. He he talks about the final destruction a little bit. In, yeah. Well, that's what Brother Ogden. That's why he n named this book the Avenging of the Apostles and Prophets. The destruction of Jerusalem was the final blow to end the Jewish dispensation. The law had been nailed to the cross, Colossians 2 and Ephesians 2. And all the worship was ended in 70 AD because the temple was destroyed. All the genealogical records were destroyed. Everything was, it was, the city was flattened. But yeah, he had vengeance on them, but he, he still kept the remnant in Jer Jeremiah because why? It's through them that Christ would come. And once Christ came, the need for Judaism was over. It was set up after Abraham. It was set up uh, to create a nation, to give them a law, to guide them and tutor them and educate them so that through them Christ would come. Back to Galatians 3. And once he came and died on the cross, all of that was fulfilled. He said, I don't come to destroy the law. I come to what? Fulfill it. Like you, like you keep a doctor's appointment. You fulfill it. You set it aside. It's over. He fulfilled the law. He completed it. That phase of God's uh, contract, if you want to call it, that's what a covenant is, with Israel was over. So, yeah, he talks about it in Jeremiah. In fact, he, all, there's, there's hints all through the Old Testament that, that that law was not permanent. Even though the Hebrew uses the word forever and ever, uh, that can mean an indefinite time, not eternity. Uh, much study is, Solomon said, a weariness to the flesh, which is probably why most people don't want to study the Bible or anything nowadays. It takes time and effort, and sometimes you wind up bleary-eyed with a headache, but if we don't study, we're not going to understand it. Okay, uh, chapter 6 is the first six seals on the scroll, and we are about out of time. Um, any other questions or comments or anything? Uh, read Brother Do Ogden's notes and look at his workbook, because the workbook is just a very sim simplified version of the book, looks like. And if we need to go back, oh, we can go back to chapter 1, I don't care, but if you have a question... Let's, let's resolve it. Let's not go on with any confusion. I want us to all be on the same page. You know, what did Paul tell the church at Corinth? That they need to be of one mind and one understanding. So let's strive for that.